Oh, thanks for making the trek up here, Appreciate man. Appreciate it. So um, I know you said last time I was talking to you was in the Laugh Factory. You said you've been doing stand up for twenty three years. Yeah, since two thousand. Since two thousand, started literally uh, nineteen ninety nine when they was talking about Y two K because I had a car that actually was affected by Y two K, but a computer went out on it and it never drove again. I think I left it on New Year's Eve somewhere. Okay. With, with my at the time girlfriend in comedy, so it was ninety nine. I was doing uh, D Ray's New Year's show. That's how everything kind of sink in. Because it was like, I get to do D Ray's New Year's show. Yeah. Uh, I did go up, and my car got left at the venue we was at. Yeah. But the night was so good, I didn't even care. It's like, it's not a comic now. I just came with the show. Fuck that comic, be rich. Be rich, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> 23 years into the future. Look where I'm at, boy. <laughs> That's how it felt. How did you, how did you get started? <laughs> like, um, what, what made you even decide to give this a shot? Damien Williams actually uh, came to my job and told me I'm a comedian because I had did a TV show at the time called Jenny Jones where we just roast the people and talking stuff. And they kept having me come back, come back, and then I asked them for like a hundred dollars to buy an outfit, and they stopped bringing me in. And uh, but on the show, I made a spectacle of myself and many people. Uh, yeah, and that's how I did it. It was uh, Jenny Jones, and I was against Rude Jude at the time, who got a radio show in Detroit. But that was uh, our start in entertainment, or my start in entertainment. Mm. So you've been in entertainment since day one, since like you were... Yeah, I was on TV before I even was doing comedy. Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, like, as a kid, were your parents encouraging you to be in performance? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. I'm, what what I'm was it? call up some days, but the, my mama passed away. My grandma really sick, but they were not encouraged. To this day, my grandma still don't take comedy like it's a real job to have. She... You know, like all oh, y'all in the family failed. Everybody, I'm just, I'm just so dis disappointed. But you know, I just get back off a tour, and I've been paying bills around here. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> not until, not until you got the like the name and the license until you're on the silver screen, and she's not gonna take it seriously. Well, yeah, some of my friends are very, very successful, and that's one of the things she look at. Like, you know, all your friends blew up and and, and used you and moved around. You know, but she old school. I get it. She has a point to understand, but uh. There comes a point, place in comedy where if you're not satisfied entertaining the people in front of you, then you're not really a comedian, if you understand that. Well, can you elaborate? What do you mean? Uh, the fact that you're doing comedy for a living mm. at any level is a blessing, you know. So if you can't learn to appreciate that level of uh, they paid me to be here in front of these people right here. They paying 500 300 250 mm -hmm. That's still uh, a, a Amazing feat to pull off. Right. So it's like, why would I care about the person performing for a thousand people if I got my five hundred in front of me right yeah, now? Right. And if, and if I'm not rocking them at the level where they feel like we're supposed to give them more money, yeah, <laughs> you really can't say much because uh, you go to a hundred dollar show ticket, you go to shows that sold out, and you see these people on this high level of performance. Are you genuinely there? Is the question. Mm -hmm. You know, not mm -hmm. just I need to be on because. I've been doing it a long time, but are you really working at that level? Like, like, are you undeniable? People can't deny that every time they put you on a show, it goes well. Right. Do you feel like like you're at a place of being undeniable? Um, I can't say because I want to say how I feel. Okay. But my level of poverty says something else. <laughs> <laughs> but it's enough. also my level of, uh, I work just enough. I think a lot of us or. My own personal story is uh, mm -hmm. uh, just making it out of already what I made it through. Keeping my mental health is more important than me having another level of insanity, which is fame and fortune. What that's that's important. What what do you do to keep your mental health together? Because I know this comedy game can make people go crazy and and you know really break down mentally. So how mm -hmm. do you go about keeping it together? Be regular. Just do regular stuff. Be regular people. Uh, have a regular love life, you know, not too much, because the fame can make you four or five girlfriends and a girl in every state and all that kind of stuff. So, just regular level-headed people around you that uh, that yeah. are um, keep you calm. Kids really do it. Well, this is my first time being around a kid, but the uh, relationship I'm in now is uh, I want to say we have a daughter, but you know she has a child and uh, it's very uh, leveling. Mm. Very uh, humbling. Humbling, yeah. It brings you back to uh, generally what you do comedy for. Because 
kids want to be entertained. They want to laugh. Mm. And having that energy around a family is like the nucleus of uh, why we do what we do. Yeah, I've met I've met comics with with children or who have people to take care of, and they grind in a different level. It's yeah. there's some there's some pressure that's added. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it sounds like you feel that I guess healthy pressure. Yeah, it's it's actually that's exactly what uh, I've been we've been dating for a minute, and that's that's like I feel it. You look the kid in the eye, and you can do comedy and be cool, you know, drinking, playing, kicking it. But there's also a level that's like a, a gear where, you know, everything is all the way 100% serious. And uh, I'm, I haven't hit that level yet because it's been such a fun career. Mm. But, uh, but now with this situation, I'm like, oh, man, I, I'm about to pay a mortgage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't spend half my money on amazing strands of weed and, you know what I'm saying, uh, top shelf <laughs> liquor and flights and, you yeah. know what I mean? Sweets, because, you know, I, I travel, I live a great lifestyle, but it's like now, okay, man, uh, you might have to drive 20 grand on this special, mm. you know? You, shit. June, you know? You, so you're making, you're having a special in June? Uh, I have to have a special this year. I don't know when, but okay. I, I'm going to have to get like 20 grand up and do it, which okay. is not impossible. Uh, I threw, I've been throwing shows in the city for a lot of time, and I spent a lot of money on producing shows and events. Yeah. Uh, if, if my biggest expense in my career has been producing events. Mm. Funny thing, you talk about all this, I just was talking about the amount of productions I have out. Like, I got a, uh, my first production was a movie with this guy who stole the script and did a movie on his own. And then uh, I got several comedy specials up tape where I paid the camera people and they ran off with the, with the footage. Uh, about three podcasts, <laughs> 10 episodes of the sketch comedy show uh, that I did with Hannibal Burris, where we still haven't put it out, but I might just throw it on YouTube. Uh, but productions has been my claim to financial ruins or, well, you know, a level of uh, having a really nice catalog, I would say. Yeah, that was a really positive spin you just put on that. You mm -hmm. went from ruins to catalog. I yeah, dig it's, it. It's, it's, today is financial ruins because uh, I got to pay like three grand to go. To, the, to go to LA in about a month. Uh -huh. And uh, when you're doing comedy, some trips don't pay. LA, New York, because you're going out there to work and make contact. So it's like going on a vacation mm -hmm. without the beach. <laughs> now, okay, oh, this neighborhood is full of crime. Oh, Let's yeah. Oh, the, the, they, I had a break in literally last week. Like, uh, this shit, you can't escape it. Um, well, they can't King Von around my <laughs> block. <laughs> You got a mirror on the wall. <laughs> Keep <fire> with mission. <laughs> I got I wrote a couple things down. You you were we were talking about this too at the Laugh Factory. You're thinking about like slowing down, stopping drinking because you feel like it's a uh, um, in the way of the professionalism. Uh, it's not in the way of professionalism. Okay. I can be a professional to a certain level. Uh, I don't. I'm, I I would say I'm a light alcoholic, as in I drink, but you don't really see me drunken yeah. all over the place, uh, and people wouldn't notice really because. I just drink because we at the club for four hours. Right. Um, I think but that, it's a level of clarity when you, it's like uh, I was comparing it to Allen Iverson compared to Kobe Bryant. You know what I mean? Some people really talented. And Allen Iverson can play drunk. You know, as we know now, he was drunk most of the time and still hooping. But Kobe was a level of professionalism that won in rings. So it's like you can be great, but greatness is the, ex, the extra gear of I'm sober, I'm fully aware. I didn't go out last night. I rested. Uh, I didn't even talk to my girl for two days because I didn't want to throw me off and I'm finna do this special. You know what I mean? But it's a level of, you know, this is my special or this is my show, and I'm gonna take it to uh, another level. It's um, it's it sounds like it's putting your priorities in the right place. Man, have and have. Because <laughs> uh, I know some people who a lot of people who do it drunk and have very successful careers. It, yeah. It doesn't stand in the way of you accomplishing things. It's just a personal choice. Sure. Because uh, some people next level is unlocked when they have a couple of drinks, you know. Mm -hmm. But for me, since I've been doing it so long in the gray, sometimes so I, I want to see what it's like with actual 100% clarity. Uh, and I haven't done a, a comedy special yet. So, uh, like, one has been introduced to the industry. Mm -hmm. So this one, when I do do it, uh, I want a certain level of actually my next couple of projects. I just want to see what is what what it's like. 
or try to unlock another level. You, um, so you're making this special and it's producing on your own, right? Definitely. Like, now, how do you even go about that? Because most people, when they, I'd imagine when they think about comedy specials, especially if they don't do comedy, they're like, oh, you set up a tripod and then it just happens. But I'd imagine it's a little more complicated. Like, well, well, I start with the content first. Okay. Uh, what do you want to name it? Uh, what is your target audience? Who do you want to talk to? How do you want to dress? Who do you want to be seen? The things that you have to be aware of as a, as a person producing the product. Mm. You know, uh, like Quincy Jones in a sound lab trying to figure out what's the new sound. What's the new sound? Watching other people's specials. Uh, seeing what special was the best. Seeing what special was the worst. See where you want to fall in at. Are you really, uh, do you have to work out to get to another level? Like, you know, uh, as in writing more jokes or doing more things or deeper, more deeper into your own personal relationships, you know? Mm -hmm. Fuck your life up a little bit. Sometimes argue with your girl, you know what I mean? Separate yourself, isolate, uh, make it about you over everybody. You know, it's a couple mm -hmm. different things you go into, as in like Rocky, uh, have to fight, you know, uh, Mr. T, you know? There was a, um, I think it was a, a quote I've heard recently. Uh, the quote goes something like, um, a true artist is born when uh, the family dies. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know if we. I've never heard that, but that definitely makes sense. Yeah, the idea. Yeah, that, them <laughs> the idea that like you become your best art, your best artistry comes out when you're the most personable, but then you're dragging everyone, everyone around you is going down with that material. Like I think about when Kevin Hart's was it? I think it was Grown Little Man mm -hmm. when he when he talked about Tory and he's he, like he's dropping names and it was when he put out the most personal stuff was when things started to go higher. Well, yeah, my interpretation of that would be, uh, yeah, your general family dies as importance to you, mm -hmm. and your fan family becomes more important. Mm. You know, as in. Uh, I'm gonna tell y'all on these niggas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, I'm tell. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell these people about y'all, mother. Y'all acting a fool, and I'm gonna tell them about it. So be more concerned with what the fans are feeling and knowing than how your family feel. Mm. I definitely understand that. Like I would say, yeah, for everybody I will consider anything is definitely the case where people in the family know we do something. It's gonna. It's gonna be on the special. We gonna. Right. We gonna hear about it. But uh, I'm not concerned about how y'all feel no more. Y'all don't matter as much, but y'all gonna be here. Y'all ain't going nowhere. And then when the money come, y'all gonna benefit from it. So yeah. yeah, I can understand that. That makes sense. Do you? So you you have a at this point you say you have a fan base. Uh, you, you know more than likely I do. I I'm I've been throwing shows in this city a long time, and when I'm out, I I feel celebrity like, especially in the city, because mm. people do speak to me. People do know me from comedy. They do stop me and talk or take pictures sometimes. Yeah. But I've seen other people with fan bases sell tickets at, <laughs> at a, lot, a lot higher rate. And I remember being that, and I'm not what I used to be, but I haven't really tried as much. I feel like I've been doing things differently. I feel like when I do have some work people coming out to, they will come. Uh -huh. But right now, um, I haven't produced anything. I mean, it sounds like you're making this special and you're going to put it out there. And I... I I'm excited for that. Yeah. When I, when I, when that special comes out, I really like to see it. Yeah, I gotta get the twenty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> you and are you? Do you have the day job? You still gotta. No, I haven't worked a day job in years. So if it wasn't for your adult responsibilities that you have, you could live like me and be fine. I live like this kind of, but uh, I live dual lifestyles where I do have a a woman with a mortgage and you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and I do. You know, provide for that family and keep my lifestyle going. But I've always had my own apartment. Right. And no matter who I dated, no matter how serious a relationship you get, I just believe you should have your own space. space. Right, yeah. right, right. Even if you got an office with a shower and a bed, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's better than uh, it gives balance, though, because I think a lot of women are worried about taking care of a man, uh -huh. you know, because you have so many successful women now. Uh, so you should always let everybody know I can take care of myself. You know? Right. Shit, I can live. I'm good, and my place is straight, and I don't need this, you know. But I think that's just uh, a part of the uh, part of one of the things that keep things really uh, real playful for me. As in, regardless of what I have a 
head, roof over my head and, yeah. you know, apartment with Jordans in the closet. <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> to the worst case scenario. You can survive, you can survive on your own merit. Yeah, you like, what, I, yeah. what I like to think, uh, you know, on the wire when Marlo just stopped and saw a corner and he saw somebody on the corner, he just punched him and took his drugs. Mm. I feel like that about comedy. Like, wherever you drop me at, you know, I will rebuild mm -hmm. and start from scratch with jokes, you know. Where did this work ethic and resolve come from? Like, because I know, I know your family was like, nah, you're not doing this tap dancing bullshit, but you did it anyway. Where does that grind and that drive mentality come from, if you could uh, even describe it? Uh, well, my family is full of criminals. Everybody <laughs> pretty much was hustlers. And, and we always, and I always had hustle in me. So okay. my family didn't even look at, like, they didn't even, they thought I was conning. Oh, you doing comedy, huh? I'm just <laughs> making people laugh. And so the, uh, I moved out when I was 15. And you know what I'm saying? I never really sold drugs, but I sold stuff. And uh, I know that sounds crazy. I had a lot of stolen merchandise and okay. credit card scams before scamming was scamming and the apartment was full of products and you know I did you know once you're in the market you know people in the market so people bring you stolen merch all the time with hey man you get this off of this is so I, I was always that kind of guy mm. so when I was around street niggas or drug dealers or whatever and we all shooting for a thousand dollars a hundred dollars or whatever it was like what the fuck is you doing here you know but that transitioned over to comedy because the comedy is full of street niggas and hustlers. And <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the, it's the same. It was the same shit. Okay. So you grew up a uh, hustle environment and you just translated that from something illegal to legal. If comedy is legal. Because <laughs> yeah. technically, okay. by, uh, when it comes to comedy, mostly most comedians go down by taxes mm. because we're getting tickets and cash. So... It depends on what you call legal. You know what I mean? Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> hopefully no guns involved in comedy. No, nah, I would okay. definitely not say guns are definitely involved in comedy. <laughs> yeah, you fucking crazy. <laughs> well, I guess you really don't know Southside comedy. It's different. I'm getting to know it. I mean, when I first... When when I, I I don't know if you know much about me and where I come from. A little bit. I just know you're from L.A. From I'm from Riverside, California. I'm from the desert. Okay, it's yeah. California. I think I looked at it as... I don't think you... Cleared it up anyway. <laughs> Riverside, the, so the okay. I'm like, you know the same shit. <laughs> you know, um, uh, like was it like Rawlett, Indiana, or Ju Indiana, uh, uh, Illinois, Juliet in Illinois, or Joliet, Joliet or um, Aurora, Illinois? I'm that of California. So you, yeah, you've been, you've been to L.A. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you been to San Diego? Mm, I think so. Okay, and then there's San Francisco. Those are like the three big yeah. spots. Yeah, I've been to San Francisco. But California's big, and it's mostly a desert. And so, yeah. like, I'm not from LA. I'm from I'm from um, you know where white people drive doom buggies and like drink Mountain Dew and shit, have bonfires and shit. Same shit. All right, because you know LA, they all be all over California. Uh -huh. When I go to hang out with my LA people, they want to go mountain climbing and. Yeah. Out there with pumas and shit, so yeah, it's all the same shit. I know you're trying to specify, but it's just like me being in LA saying I'm I'm from Gary, you know, outside. It's, it's the same. <laughs> you're from Chicago, yeah, you're like, from, yeah, yeah, yeah the same. Um, but I moved out here, man. Be, p part of it was because of what I believe is um, a lot of respect towards the South Side and West Side of comedy, mm -hmm. and I wanted, I knew I needed those skills. Like it's real easy for me to do well in the burbs or around like white people is real easy because they feel comfortable around mm -hmm. me but when i go into like bar 10 for instance it's a completely different energy and i know that they're not that i have to earn a different type of respect everybody feel that though i feel it every you, you see sometimes i go up and i'll be like eh. yeah sometimes i go up and i'll be like hey but it's like everybody feel that same energy that's the that's what makes you learning to fight that energy was makes you uh what makes you i guess uh a Chicago legend in so many words. You know? Yeah, and I—that's what I want, man. I want—I want Chicago legend. No, well, yeah, you—you you definitely gotta come on the South Side way more. It's almost to the point where uh, I think uh, I've been out there twenty some years. Yeah. And they, I, this last room I've been doing Francis where we stopped for where well, I've been like three or four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and our baby was a little legendary before that because I did a couple of things that were kind of upscale. But um, yeah, you gotta build your stories up, man. Your stories of uh, fighting niggas and <laughs> that head injury shit, like, yeah, 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 all kind of shit. He cursed out two big girls, and, and they baby daddies <laughs> came up here. You know what I mean? He roasted their ass too. You know, you got it. It takes that. I like uh, Chicago's so serious, man. I was, I was doing a spot 
a friend opened a club up and we was going going to the neighborhood. I didn't say the neighborhood, but well, it was a West Side neighborhood. And uh, to do the spot, I had to meet with the the drug dealers. Of, well, I don't say the drug dealers. The niggas over the neighborhood mm-hmm. to make sure that when the show let out, when no cars gonna be broken into and niggas won't be getting shot over there. But I had to meet with them. It was a serious ass meeting. I go into the meeting. It was it felt stupid, but it was like. It was real, it was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Mm. So, right, so I'm gonna let you have a spot over here. And you know, I'll make sure there ain't no problems. But you know, say something funny, nigga, make sure you're real. <laughs> and he really did that. And I said something about somebody, it was it was talked about how this shit is stupid. And uh, he laughed and then he's like, you won't have no problems at the spot, man. It won't be no problems. Yeah. And we ain't had no problems. But it was a definitely a neighborhood where if it, was sh- it was shoot on this corner, the comedy spot was two steps over. And by our show, we was there maybe a summer or two. And, yeah, we didn't have no problems. So yeah. that was, uh, I felt a uh, kind of crime comedy boss like that time. Yeah. It was, it was one of the moments where I was like, damn, we really meet with the drug lords over this neighborhood to make sure our <laughs> show is successful. That but it was is. the same thing when we started Francis. We had to talk to the aldermen and, and the people over the neighborhood. Mm. But it's, uh, the neighborhood is 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 what is the deciding factor on the, on the South Side. It's like, yeah, to get in front of your family and tell jokes they gonna tell you if you're funny or not, yeah. and they gonna hate on you in your face, and they might fight you if you, you know what I'm saying, if you come in the wrong way. Yeah, I had a, I had a moment. Uh, yeah, see, <laughs> you can't run for the moments, man. You gotta take that ass whooping, man. It's, but well, it's, it's. I love it. I love it. Like, I like the intensity. I like the, the scrutiny. I like that there is a, a standard there that that. You ever, you ever been in a room, I would say more north side, maybe out in the burbs, you ever been in a room where you're watching a comic go up and there's polite laughter? Mm-hmm. Like, just let them bomb. Mm-hmm. Just, you don't have to, just let, it's fine. Like, See, that's why I drink. I go to the rooms up north yeah. and I be so angry <laughs> at the level of comedy. <laughs> and then it's like, y'all don't want to book me. I can't do this fucking room. Uh-huh. You mean to tell me I got to wait and I got to talk to people and I got to hope this motherfucker like me and this is the kind of comedy y'all doing? You know, because it's like, you see up North Commons judging South Commons, but we can do their rooms. They couldn't do our rooms. Let's, so it's, it's crazy that I have to fight to get on shows up North, but they couldn't even do five minutes at the rooms that I'm in regularly. I want to dig into that because that was something, when I, when I moved out uh, to Chicago, people said it's segregated, but I didn't know, mm-hmm. like the level of segregation was is really, I mean, st- it's an, it's a lot. It's like if you if you go to Sox Stadium and beyond, you're you're not going to see a white person. Mm-hmm. It was it is what it is. What is how to put this? What is the difference in the vibe and the energy between the two between South Side Comics and North Side Comics? How would you describe uh, the difference? Comedy IQ. At the end of the day, you get in front of these hood crowds and you think it's all oh, they ghetto. They, they don't know, it's the level of comedy content they actually ingest. Mm-hmm. So they understand at a level of comedy like a comedian. So you're in a, you're in a room full of people that know how to roast, mm. they know how to talk shit, they got real problems in their life, that if you're saying something that ain't real about relationships or that ain't connecting, they like, no nigga, that ain't real. So it's not what you think as in all these motherfuckers ghetto. Cause even rooms like Francis or whenever, when you go to a comedy club, Oh, you out. These are the people that got money that's out. These mm. not the, oh, these are broke hood. No, broke hood doesn't go nowhere. These people are people that live in the hood for whatever reason. Some people got money just like the hood. Some people just like being at a ghetto ass spot. Mm-hmm. You'd be shocked how many Maseratis be outside of Francis. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But the level of act, the the level of comedy they they understand. These people that go to see Mike Epps, they go downtown, they backstage, they buy VIP tickets to New Year's. You know what I mean? But they love comedy at a level that uh, New York love rap. Mm. So that's the difference technically because when they come up, the North side has come out South uh, and they come up there with that, you know, half ass worked on, you know, I don't want to have sex with my mom because my, you know, my <laughs> penis is small. That self-deprecation shit, that shit just, so, just but, don't fly. And you, you, you grew up, you grew up South side. Yeah, you still, still South yeah, side. So yeah. you, you never like lived around white people? Uh, South Side is getting gentrified. I had a condo in like, I was like 45th, and oh. we had like white neighbors, and uh, uh oh, and uh, yeah, she emailed the whole building about me smoking weed inside the condo because she got a baby that's coming, yeah, and uh, you know, the woman I had at the time was 
because I wrote a nice email back. Okay. Like, I'm smoking. Your baby's smoking. This is a smoking building, bitch. You ain't going to tell me what to do inside of the shit I pay. <laughs> but she made me erase it. And maybe since the building association meeting, and this little white lady go crazy. But um, but you've never been surrounded by white people. No, nah, no. Nah, I'm a super ghetto. That's, I guess, one of my things I'm worried about. Because I'm like, man, am I too ghetto? Because it's not cool to be ghetto like it used to be. Now it's kind of becoming like... I'm old because everybody now is so culturally mixed. Yeah. Man, I'm still like, I still say slightly racist shit. Yeah. There's, there's normal conversation to me. I say, I mean, okay. It's funny because when when you talk about the the white the the white dudes fucking the moms and doing the, my small dick and everything, my penis is so small, <laughs> I, my mom's ass is so big. I mean, like, bro, if you saw my mom, if you saw my mom, bro. <laughs> I can tell, like, why Why don't y'all do comedy that try to get you some pussy and not make vaginas feel weird in the crowd? But you know. it, It's funny, like, as someone who, who uh, I've always had the too black for the white kids, too white for the black kids. Mm -hmm. Like, I've never really had a space call, to call home, a place where I go and everyone around me gets me. Like, when, when, I'm, when I'm in the North Side and I hear white comics talk, I understand where they're coming from, minus the mom fucking. I understand where they're coming from. It's not just me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of pedophilia, <laughs> mom, mom fucking. fucking yeah. uh, I, I, pen I, penis I, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but penis little and uh, fuck with Bobby. It's what, yeah. what I think it is, is you pointed it out earlier um, about how Southsiders will talk about struggle. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of personal experience to draw from, a lot of real pain to draw from, and a lot of, um, I guess I'll say white people. I won't even say North Made Southers. up pain. Yeah, or it, it's, I don't want to, because I think everybody goes through something, hum, it's just in human nature, you go through stuff, but their pain is easily digestible. Is it, I, I still want to say fake pain. Okay. Why, okay. Why, cause last show I went to, and I don't know the comment's name, and I don't even want to be mean. Sure, no, you ain't. But I'm going to talk about the jokes. Okay. They were saying they were mad at their father for being a clown and uh, and upset that he, he paid her college and her rehab with clown money. And I was in my mind like, you got a dad? You know what I'm saying? With a job <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that paid bills and you was mad that he wasn't good enough for you because he was a clown. You know how hard it was for him to get up and yeah. put on a clown face to pay bills? Like, how dare you? You know, I was so mad at, at, at the comic like, why would you, he was a clown. Yeah. And the fact that you're a comedian lets you know that that was probably a real thing for him. And it just turned into him being a, com a clown and you became a comic. But your comedy is crying about a dad that you felt wasn't good enough for you. Mm -hmm. It just was heartbreaking to hear. And something that I, I would think anybody from the South said to have it, father probably would be like, you had a dad. I was going to get over it. Like, yeah. he was a clown. And my mom and my dad was together. And he paid for rehab. Y'all had rehab money? Yeah. Man. But that's what, when I hear complaining about, it just doesn't sound even realistic, yeah. you know? Black people, we go through more than I think that they can fathom. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely uh, shit. My daddy was on crack. <laughs> and around. That's what's even worse. So I, people say crack and not around. Then it was on crack and parenting. You know how they, what that's like? <laughs> hey, look, I want you to go in there and make sure that you keep yourself together. Because you still want you to steal big, son. Right? That's, you know what I'm saying? Fight like, <laughs> fight with a brick, son. Because these motherfuckers <laughs> bite the teacher in the face. You know? <laughs> real, real life story, though. Yeah. I was in eighth grade and, uh, the state took me from my father from like water to state. Like they was like he was like, Yeah, I want to be a father of these kids. They was like, No. Nah. <laughs> I appreciate you trying, but we're gonna go and take them kids from you. We think they got a better chance in the system than you as a parent. You clearly, you clearly all over the place. And he was. Uh so like a week before I graduated eighth grade, this nigga show up with a full blue tuxedo with the ruffles in the middle. Yeah. Drunk. Yeah, like he's going to prom. Yeah, yeah, like he's going to prom. So he show up with a gift that was like stolen and shit. And he outside my door and they just let him peek in the class and he waving and shit with a tuxedo. So it was just like, that was my dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. He wasn't gonna miss my eighth grade graduation, but he was a week early, just on the day he decided to come up to the school and get all security riled up. But he was charming. They let him in the class to speak. But uh, yeah, that's, that's one of my you, stories. You got real stories. Yeah, real. Yeah. 
dad stories. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Man, your daddy ever took you on a shootout? <laughs> a real drive-by? He put a bulletproof vest on top of us, told us to lay down in the back seat. Pop, 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 the shells dropping on us. Anyway. Are there, okay, are there any white comics that you look at or listen to where you're like, man, I really like him or her? Uh, I like all comedy, really. I mean, like, even, even that night, even those things, even that being her subject or uh, their subject. Sure. Uh, uh, it was, the perspective was entertaining. I don't, I'm not a person that look at comedy and, and uh, anybody do comedy and look at the bad. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, just doing this shit for free or for $50 in a club it demands a certain amount of respect. Mm. So I, re- I think all of us would, even if you come to a Southside show, the underlying factor, they just want you to try. You know, and if you don't fit in, you it's not something that you ask for, it's something you demand. Mm. You know, and they just want that respect. Like, you don't come here, we just gonna give you right. uh, our support and our love. You got to write the jokes to earn it. And that's all they want. I think any crowd wants that. Yeah, yeah, man. I feel, I felt, I feel that. Like in going to the South Side, I feel that. I feel exactly what you're describing, and I feel like the place I'm at personally right now is, is being myself regardless of it not being in the box that people want me to be in. Like, for I, I know I'm perceived as very strange when I go on stage in the South Side. That's because you're saying it though, but it's not as strange as you think. Like, mm. uh, most of us especially south side motherfuckers go up north and try to fuck white girls and talk proper you know what i mean hey how you doing we wish we could do it better you yeah. know what i mean so it's not it's not something that as far fetched as you feel you yeah. just we all go off on our own islands and have these other culture personalities that you know we want to experience it's not different just like white people coming out south and want to you know what I'm saying? You want to go to a real underground club where they shooting it. Like, you would love, if you had a club and they shooting it, you'd be like, oh, I made it out safe. <laughs> right? You'd I like, heard the story. That shit was real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's no different. It's just it's just like getting on in, this, in comedy. It's not the business. It's when you're ready to take that spot. Mm. You know, I'm going to do these Southside clubs. I don't give a fuck how they feel about me. Mm-hmm. This is who I am. Because y'all only a percentage of my crowd. I got y'all, I got... You know, the ages, I got the black. So I'm doing comedy for everybody. And who I keep, who I keep, who I don't, who I don't. Mm -hmm. This is who I am. Fuck it. You know? But it's never, uh, (laughs) you're never going in and asking for love. That's them asking to get robbed. It's demanding. Yeah, you're demanding that shit. Just because I'm doing my, we at a comedy club. I got five minutes, which is five minutes. I'm going to do my job and tell jokes. And you'll be shocked how many people, uh, you know, I be downtown. I be up north. I like going to Zanies. You know what I mean? I don't really like this club anyway. I just be here because, you know, you'd be shocked. So it's like, yeah, just just take your shit. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I do. I mean, I try to get down to Southside Mike as much as possible. I'm sure you, you see how far I am up. That's far as shit. Yeah, it's real far. Yeah. So I, I always got to ride with like Ty or whatever. But when I, I, I it's, it's something that is not lost on me. And mm-hmm. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, but enough about me. You said you were talking about stolen scripts and, and, and shit. And I, you know, another thing I'm, I'm, I'm understanding more and moving to Chicago is, is kind of the griminess that is the entertainment industry. Oh, that's the world, man. It's worse than everywhere else. Mm. But yeah, that's just, uh, you go into a green, working with people, eyes open, and they uh, promise you a lot. A lot of times I think uh, I, over, I over deliver. So, um, me saying I'm going to do a comedy special to a regular guy who's like, I got a camera, they had definition, whatever, it sounds really okay, dude, might be funny, but then when they see it and it's like, oh, shit, this motherfucker's really got something, mm-hmm. this footage is really worth something, then the whole conversation changes, you know, as in they're keeping the footage, they want more money, they want this, they want that, you know what I mean? How do you find yourself, how do you protect yourself from that? There's not a lot of protection. I mean, you don't have a lawyer. Uh, shit, I don't want to call none of my brothers because they crazy. So, yeah, you, you just got to kind of uh, self-produce everything and, and, and control as much as you can. Mm-hmm. What is your um, goal, I guess? Like, uh, on your deathbed, you look back at all of this. What would what What would have to happen for you to feel like I'm satisfied? Or has it already happened? Five movies about three to five specials, uh, five movies, one of them being a, a, a like I would say, a, a cult classic or 
a blockbuster hit or both. Um, and um, maybe working with uh, a list of friends that I started with, us actually getting a project together and finished, I think that would be, um, for the industry, something that would get, uh, that would be uh, ground shaking for everybody, you know. But the people that I started with, uh, a core of Chicago comedians on them five movie projects or part of them specials or a project outside of those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and a couple million dollars, I think, a level up. <laughs> yeah. You know, art and, and creating with my friends. I sold yeah. some bitches on a boat. I get you. No, I have bitches. I want uh, I want some land in Mississippi and a couple other things, but uh, uh, so a secure family probably. Mm -hmm. Let's say they got kids, and uh, you know, me and the lady I'm with now, we working on uh, having a secure family. So I think a family is wasn't as much as an agenda as it is now, but it is. Yeah, the having, um, I think you were talking about this earlier, how fame can swallow you up. And yeah. If you don't have that stability. Go crazy out here. I, you think it's about bitches on the boat. But I'm not <laughs> saying all the bitches on the boat even care about you or they waiting on you to marry them and take your money or they want to have babies and put you on child support. But bitches on the boat is a very complex thing. You know, you, do you know these bitches? Are they tested? You know, is one of them gonna burn you? Yeah. Is one of them gonna poke a hole in the condom? You know what I mean? Do they got niggas waiting on the shore for when y'all get back to rob you? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you got bitches on the boat is, what bitches? <laughs> Who are these bitches? <laughs> Do you love them? Cause you need bitches you love. But then you call them ladies. Cause you love these ladies, but could they be bitches still? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen someone wax philosophical about the bitches on the boat, but I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really not to think about. <laughs> when you think about it, you're like, damn, who are these bitches? <laughs> are they real bitches nowadays? <laughs> they can look like bitches, but you get up close. I, uh, I got they cannot be bitches. <laughs> I got a question for you. I wrote it down because I don't know if it's something you want to talk about or not. So we'll no, question. No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. All right, I'm just making sure, man. Yeah. Just making sure. It's, uh, it's on HBO. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hear tell a, a story of legend where you got into a, a, a physical altercation with another comedian. Me, me and real roommates for about eight years or so, five years. I we don't know. It was a legendary time in our life, but we had over twenty fights. We were the fightingest comedians in comedy. <laughs> People don't know real is the most thuggest nigga in the history of Chicago comedy. To me, I don't know anybody that's had more fights than him. Me and him personally had so many fights, but let alone fights with niggas on the streets. And we was doing clubs in the hood, and he wasn't scared of nobody. Like, I, I've stopped, stopped niggas from killing real so many nights. So many nights. And he probably remembers some of the nights if, we, if he was here to talk talk about it. But, uh, yeah, we he's from the west side. I'm from the south side. And as I said, I started around criminals and with criminals. And most of the people that was in my crew or around the crews we was around, you know, they said dead in jail is, Mm. A real thing, you uh, know. We would, when a club was shoot letting out, and they say these boys and jumped on security. Those are the people I was with at the time, and uh, so throwing shows and real being real, he's always himself. Uh, but more than anything, he come off as nerdy and quiet. But that's a real bona fide in the trenches, West Side nigga. Mm. So you say some shit to him that he found disrespectful. He was punching. You say some shit to me, I found disrespectful. I was punching you, so we was constantly punching people. So we'll roast you and fight you. Jeez. You know, that was just our thing. At our shows, at the time, the stage was like a gladiator thing for me. And it was more like, you disrespecting my show, you disrespecting me. So when I roast you, I want to see you cry in the morning. As in, I'm saying some shit so mean and real, so honest, and, and that the people around you will be like, damn, ugh, you can't wear that shit no more. Or you, nigga, we know you, bitch ass nigga. Whatever it was, but we was uh, scrappers. But the story was real. Uh, one of his girlfriends had a, uh, just was a bitch. I ain't gonna lie. She was so mean. And uh, she was mean, let me tell you, mean on the level of, she told this man she was pregnant several times and we all ended up to pay for abortions back when abortions was regular. We didn't have more than that to pay. We just had to pay for the abortion. And sometimes women were scheming and saying, I'm pregnant, I need abortion money. But taking the money and an abortion at that time was like $500. So we talking about $500 in 2005, 2002. That was a lot of money. So uh, we was ending up paying for a couple of them. We like this our second, third one. And we know the nigga reckless. And I know that's a lot of business, but he started the story. So I'm just telling the truth. So uh, this day, I don't know what happened when I wasn't driving my little truck. I had a little truck I was driving. And I don't know if my girlfriend had it. I don't know. But uh, I was like, I need to ride home. And she was the only bitch going my way. So I get in the car. 
and she finally get to lay it on me. So I'm taking it 10 minutes, five minutes, something, whatever. And I finally was like, first, because I'm looking like, nigga, how are you letting this woman talk to me like this? Like, oh, so she, all three of you are in the car. Yeah, so she just going in. You did the blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I just didn't call her a bitch. Just out of be like, bitch. Mm -hmm. It was more like, bitch, your ass having these abortions, you ain't all, this goofy nigga, you know, whatever I said, it was real as fuck. And when I when I got out the car, I really thought he would get out with me or say something. Or be like, girl, drop this nigga off quick. You know what, all this shit. You are wild. Because eventually they did break up because everything I was saying was real. But uh, yeah, I walked from, I would say, Kizzy to motherfucking Halsted would be the walk at 3 in the morning. But I was so mad, I didn't even really know or care. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the time I got to him, we motherfucking scrapping. And it was a long fight. Like, a lot of throwing around. The nigga lost the fight for five, ten minutes. But I finally was like, all right. And he jumped on my back and was choking. And I just was like, I know that. This, I just beat this nigga ass. I know he not going to try that. Because when whenever I wake up, I'm fighting again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he wound up choking me out. And I think that was our, that wasn't even our last fight. I think we had about four or five fights after that. So the point where we was fighting so much, people just got tired of watching us. They got, it was just boring. Yeah, because we really was brother fighting. Like, it wasn't like yeah. real fighting. I think after that, he eased up too. Yeah. Because, you know, like, I was fighting him like a brother. And we had all these brother fights. And that fight, it went too far. And I realized, like, okay, man, maybe I am hard on him. Mm. You know, because at the time, yeah, I was, nigga, I was 79. But uh, after our fights after that, we wasn't even, like, punching in the face. We just was, you know, punching and mm. punching. But, uh, shit. And this was about 2005? I don't remember, man. We fought so much. So <laughs> this is the back in the day. Back yeah, the day. yeah. We was uh, in our 20s. Yeah. Early 30s, 20s. Do, do you feel like Drunk. We didn't put the, you know, when you only way to the club with your friends. Fuck you, nigga. Felt sure. What you want to do? Fighting in the lights of the car. And then we got to go in the club with throwing shirts. <laughs> 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 it was still, he's still my wingman with the girls we met. It wasn't. Yeah. It's just roommates. You it's, know what I'm saying? If you've had roommates, yeah. you know, he's from the west side or from the south side. We just don't agree. On nothing, and we only handle shit with fisticuffs. It sounds like there's a lot of love there. Oh, man, yeah. hell yeah. It was, for him to say that and to say the names was a shout out. You know, it's no, it kind of re, uh, everybody asks me, is it you the one he's talking about? Or the people that do know, you know, it's showing that he didn't forget about us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was, uh, I took it as, as all the appreciation yeah. and respect. Because uh, anybody that know us know we real family, you know, yeah. uh, way past all this shit. We, you know, split dollar burgers, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it definitely meant to be said. That whole, if we did a, a, a sitcom on that apartment alone, it was, it would be fucking hilarious with the stories you can't remember. I wish, I wish y'all had social media so you recorded it all. Oh I would have loved God. to have seen that. Oh my God, oh. who had social media back then? <laughs> what do you think it would have been like? Because you can't, like, I started doing this for real around, a little before when Trump got elected. And so social media is a thing. Fucking Dane Cook already did MySpace shit. So before social media, I was already trying to do sketches and sketch shows and put videos up. Uh, if you look at my YouTube page, I got uh, a series of so that I had produced on my own at the time when you had to hire a cameraman and record it and hire an editor for the edit. It. So I was paying fifteen hundred a thousand to get shit shot way back then. And uh, when social media came out, the difference for me was, I was getting paid, people would pay me to do sketches. So mm. If you wanted me to create something for you, it was writing credit and you know my time to actually shoot it. So to start doing all that shit for free, it was hard for me to transition. <laughs> transition and even still, it's like, man, now since I'm so far behind, I gotta do all these sketches for free, come up with all this work every day for free, posting three times for free. And you feed name machine, and hopefully something hit, and we all know they decide who hit, who don't hit, and they totally in control. Um, they, who's they? The industry, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the people who really actually making the real money off uh, Twitter, the executives. Mm -hmm. So now you're putting all this content out, hoping to get a return, and most times you, you're not. Mm -hmm. You got the people that are making it, but the millions of people that aren't, the millions of people that's chasing is what's feeding the machine technically. Yeah, it's it's easy to think. And social media is tricky. It's real. Like, it's, it's not that tricky. It's before social media, you a comedian as myself would shoot a sketch show, put it on a DVD, shoot an audio album, put it on a CD, and sell that at a show. So at your show, you're making two, three hundred a, a, a show, mm. just off of I sold twenty CDs today. I sold fifteen of them today. 
impossible now. Well, they you, took the whole market. When I say when I say tricky, I mean like <clears throat> when I look. Sometimes I look at posts and I think, oh, I, I compare myself too much. I, I try to keep Instagram away from me so I don't compare myself to what other comics are doing. Like for me, it tricky. It tricks me emotionally. I'm like, ugh, I want to. I'm not uh, there all yet. All that still ain't real. It, it still ain't real because, all right. Where is your financial response? Like, okay, you post it three times a day. It take what a year or two for that to catch, mm. and then uh, that start catching, and you hoping to get a check for what five to seven thousand every time something go viral, and that's once a month. You mm. know what I mean? I, I remember having a DVD where I was selling. I was selling my DVD uh, of my movie and my CD of my comedy album, and I was selling them for twenty dollars. And I was selling easy, 100, 200 a week, mm. you know. So it's like, it's really no trick. They just took the money out of our hands. When you hear about Too Short selling out the trunk, you hear about Master P selling out the trunk. We hear about all these independent artists, and, like, and uh, along with that became washing money that was street money. So they just technically stole your leverage for being your own artist and making your own way. And it, it seemed like you're making your own way, but look what the artists they got or the internet people they push out to say comedians you look at their comedy show is that comedy you can really sell you know what i mean is it a special you can put out today so it's it's seem complicated when you're looking at it just from that perspective but having 20 years mm -hmm. oh they just stole all that money they stole all that talentry they just stole it <laughs> i um working for free that's crazy i i think that i think you know <clears throat> What I what I'm I've enjoyed about you when I you know the times I'm in the South Side when I'm watching and stuff it's you do seem to garner a good deal of respect in the community mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is you know your skills as a comic and your tenure you've been doing this and you've been here and you've put in this work you've developed these relationships I throw a lot of shows and pay a lot of people a lot of money oh, so that's what okay. that's not me what, but yeah but you know everybody yeah, else yeah because with me. <laughs> My my standard and why I'm into a lot of new comics and it's gonna be the same the yeah. same conversation. Uh, it's it's easy to be a social media person or famous and all that, but do you have 20 minutes in front of a paying audience? Mm -hmm. And that's what's important to me. In 20 minutes, I need you to have 30 minutes to an hour. So the last show that I booked, uh, I booked five comics on, paid them all 500 apiece, and they all had to do 20 minutes each, mm -hmm. and the crowd wasn't there in the big the big theater. So the people that pay me, only thing they cared about was, are these motherfuckers gonna do their 20 minutes at a level of professionalism? Mm -hmm. So for me, I have to have that level of trust for you to be in a circle of people that I book. I think that's fair. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and you get that by doing my shows and me seeing you actually have that level of mm -hmm. content. And consistency. And consistency, right yeah. Right. So it's like, uh, you know, I'll be, be pretty fair about it. Most people that have fell out with me are mad at me now. Uh, I'm not throwing shows now, so I don't have that yeah. uh, to put you. But I do have Francis, and I can see it, Francis, if you got chops, yeah. you know. But I'm not throwing shows, so it, I'm even getting, I'm pulling my whole thought process out of that. But it's mostly because over the years, I've produced a lot of shows and put a lot of money in a lot of people's pocket. Yeah. So, you know, uh, relationships with certain people helps you pay your bills you um when i when i saw you at the laugh factory um you had just saw uh ryan davis mm -hmm. uh, i guess he's in town doing his thing um you seemed <clears throat> like you were really focused like the way you i mean i'll let you really get into it but it seemed like you 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 saw something that really sparked inspiration that's how i took it can yeah. You break that. What was what was going on? Uh, Ryan, I, I met Ryan Davis in North Carolina, and I was opening for D Ray a lot of years ago. I don't know if he he was just starting. He was brand new, so I would say ten, somewhere in there. Um, at the time, he, as we conversed about it last time I talked to him, he was in a place where he knew he wasn't a ghetto comic, but he knew he was ghetto, which. Um, what, what, yeah. What does that mean? That mean. Um, I'm from the hood, but I go up north and I do comedy well up there. Mm. But I'm really from the hood. But I like when they listen and they let me get my ideas out. Not like in the hood where I got a spitfire, spitfire, spitfire. So his his situation was, uh, I haven't seen anybody 
transfer being able to do hood jokes in front of a, a mainstream crowd. So when he saw me do hood jokes in front of a crowd, it kind of made him feel in place. You know, it gave him a place. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I started that. I would say Deion Cole more than anybody was the first person I saw that was ghetto as hell, but like really smart. Mm. And and watching Deion be in the hood and do both and transition over to mainstream, um, it was something he was very consistent. Like, well, I know they rowdy, but I'm gonna do my jokes. I'm not gonna cater to the crowd. I'm not gonna talk about people. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna do 20 minutes of material, and you're gonna see me do the same 20 minutes somewhere else. But learning that was because uh, I went on. I tried. I toured with Dion. We had a lot of personal conversations. A lot of development that he put into me because I understood. But uh, seeing Ryan Davis do it at a high, high level was like, it just kind of recharged my battery of, damn. Okay, I've been doing ghetto comedy, been drunk, been smoking, been just lounging in it. But to see somebody uh, all the way completely engaged was like, all right, yeah, let me uh, get reconnected to what my agenda is supposed to be. Uh, Because you get lost. Well, I got lost because uh, so much I be doing. uh, I, I have my idea for my special. But I haven't been, uh, I've just been writing jokes, just doing comedy, mm-hmm. just being funny. I got 30 minutes here, I got 30 minutes there. And it wasn't really uh, as focused as, uh, if you were to, when the special do come out, he didn't waste words, he didn't bullshit around, he didn't say hi, he just went right into content, and it was challenging content. Content about his, his mother of his child about to die, giving birth, and just really subject that was like really, life connecting and uh just made me question am i just still on the surface am i do i do i need to go deeper than where i need to go and uh, i do so yeah just like the thing about taking your spot it's the same concept uh so many great comics out here um where is my spot and it's something that you got to kind of demand and take just like coming to the hood and taking your spot so yeah. I, <clears throat> yes i want to so i got two things here and that is um I know when we talked about Ryan Davis a little bit, I met him before, and I, I don't know if, did I tell you about that interaction much? I know the whole memory thing. He, I don't know he had a story, and y'all had a story, and I don't remember neither one. Basically, I met him out in L.A., and I, it was before, it was, I was planning to move to Chicago, mm-hmm. and I was, I was, I would describe myself as hot-headed and, and um, pretty immature, and in my head, I was like, I just got to. I, I was this grind mentality, but it 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 was Galated, like it was mean and it was negative. It was like I was hurting myself with how angry I was, mm-hmm. and you know I kept talk. I remember messaging him a few times, and I was like talking about like how do I make money, man? I got how do I get on cruise ships? I got to do this, I got to do that. And I remember he kept saying, "Just work on your craft." I'm sure I could go back to those messages, and I think I I would send like long shit. Just work on your craft. And I got the sense that I fucking irritated him at a certain point. So I just, like, stopped. I, I don't think you irritated him. I think uh, I think his purpose is to that. Like, I think, you know, everybody got a purpose yeah. in comedy. I think his purpose is to remind us all to write jokes. Some people like that. Dion was like that. Mm. Uh, Ryan Davis is one of the people where... You know, you could be drunk at a club. Hey, right. <laughs> hey, man, you're a great comedian and hate to see you like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, so he's just one of the people that is going to always come back to the art of comedy. He's an artist mm-hmm. that's sensitive about the shit. So when you're around him and you say you do comedy, he takes you serious as a comedian and he want to see you win. Mm-hmm. So he's going to tell you some shit that's real about comedy. As in, uh, you inspired me, as he told me. And you one of the people that really changed my life when it comes to comedy. And I was like, what, me? Damn. I was like, hell yeah, I supposed to inspire motherfuckers, you know what I mean? But it was like, uh, the work on your craft thing is, is that's is a perfect understanding of who he is. He might have read everything, and his response may have been exactly what you needed to hear at the time. Because yeah. I would say the same thing to you. It's not uh, because all the other ways of arguing or fighting or trying to, when you get in front of these people that if it's a 30 minute special, if it's a management, if it's a booking agency, 
the only thing that matters is the level of your content. And that's not just being funny. That's was it thought provoking? Was it unique? Was it his own thing? Was it his own voice? When you're doing it a long time, as you've been doing it now, you can see right through open micers. You can see right through guys who are just getting up there and, you know, my, my penis is small and they want to fuck my mom. You know, like, dude, come on. That's, you got rich parents and you're telling them you, you don't want to work. That's, just, just say that. Uh, the second zip zip zips all of I I been made, I want to be the I want to be around you in the north side when you watch comedy I want to see I just want to see the look of your so, face I'll be so irritated <laughs> that's why I drink up though because it just be so and then everybody's so it's so dangerous you know how dangerous it is for a south side comic up north it's so dangerous what with all you, what do you mean with the, the women with the since the Bill Cosby thing mm. it really it's really like everything is rapey or. Yeah. So I like I don't even speak. You if you see me, I don't even speak. I don't even and then with the different uh, pronouns mm. and because uh, I've had I had a night at at uh, Laugh Factory before, uh, but so many white women wrote letters and he showed me the letters like meets these people, you know, <sighs> these people because I had Bill Cosby jokes. They were supportive of Bill Cosby and were honest because the truth was that was an illegal case. Anybody that knows. Basic laws know that was all that was fucking illegal, which is why he got out. But uh, um, society like to see black men lynched, and it's uh, case in point: Donald Trump versus R. Kelly. You know, yeah. Donald Trump got thirty year cases of pedophile and raping, and you know, but he the president, and they fight for him to be the president. And R. Kelly, you know, Kelly. We want him in jail yeah. for the rest yeah. of his life, yeah. and demanded. But they don't even, you know, it's it's you bring that up in front of a room that's mainstream, mm. and then you meet. <laughs> the joke was hilarious. <laughs> you were uh, you were talking earlier about going deeper after ro- watching Ryan <laughs> Davis. What? How do you plan on doing that? How do you plan on going deeper? Uh, all comedy is a life focus, and deeper as in. Uh, being more serious about how much content I'm writing mm. and how much time I spend on that content and actually having the thought process of my special in mind when I'm doing whenever I'm performing. Mm. You know, so not 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 straying left or right with I'm trying this joke out. Can it fit in my special? You know what I mean? Like and you know, uh if it's really analyzing the love in your life, really talking to your ex girlfriends, current girlfriends about how you feel or whatever and being able to interpret all that on stage, but a life focus. Mm. I think every special goes with this period of my life, picking it up and putting it on stage, you know? I have one more question. We're gonna say this to the camera, this will be fun. Oh, shit. <laughs> all right, if you, if you could say something to yourself five years from now, whatever you want, whatever you want to say, what do you want to say to yourself five years from now? Shit. You want to give it a second, you want to think about it? First thought, uh, it's going to be kind of mean, man. You got to say it to you, okay? Leave those bitches alone to get this money, man, all right? <laughs> well, okay, I, I, those bitches doesn't mean wandering sh- strays that are circling around and hooving around your financial situation, all right? Or, or bitches as in people that don't, actually believe in what you're doing and got going on and not contributing in a positive way. Or bitches as in people that are pretend friends that uh, are in your circle and causing you grief. But leave them bitches alone and get this motherfucking money. I hope you did, all right? (laughs) And you exercise. And you marry your girl you're supposed to be with. You know you're supposed to marry her, man, so. All right. Hope we marry, baby. Hope we are. (laughs) 